Hello. Okay. It is 5.03 p.m. on Tuesday, May 28th, 2024. This is a regular board meeting for the Monroe School District. Present are myself, President Bumpus, Director Barnes, Director Etzcorn, Director Whitfield. We have student representative, Sophia Willett, and Superintendent Sean Woodward, district leadership team, school district staff, as well as members of the community. Director Campbell will not be attending tonight's meeting. Members of the public can log into the regular board meeting using the Zoom link attached to tonight's agenda that is found on the board docs website. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to tonight's meeting. We are so happy to have you join us. All comments during tonight's meeting are audio recorded and will be available online on our website. This is in addition to the written minutes. Please understand that while it may appear the board is moving quickly on important matters, there have been previous discussions on these issues, either in earlier meetings or in board workshops, which are also open public meetings. Each director has had ample time to study the issues, ask appropriate questions, and obtain satisfactory answers from the superintendent, his staff, or through outside research. Those wishing to address the board during public comments must turn in a public comment form prior to the start of the meeting at 5 p.m. Any forms after the meeting has started will be held for the next meeting to address the board at that time. Okay, moving on to agenda item 2.05, is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the agenda dated May 28th, 2024. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the agenda dated May 28th, 2024. All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed four to zero. We have no presentations today. So moving on to agenda item 4.01, student representatives, and we have Sophia. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I always have a hard time turning that on. I'll just run you down the week because there's quite a few things happening. So first we have Spirit Week this week, and today was Crazy Hat and Hair Day. And then Wednesday is anything but a backpack day, but nothing alive. And then Thursday is West Coast versus Wild West. And then Friday is class colors, which is freshmen are red, sophomores are green, juniors are blue, and then seniors are pink. And then at high school, we've been having lunchtime activities. And tomorrow is pot painting in the commons. And then, and then Friday, we also have our spring pep assembly. And then... Also Friday, we have Spring Fling, which starts at five with the tailgate and there will be a baseball versus softball game. And then a color run at seven and the dance starts at nine. And then during the whole time, there will be food trucks, coloring, water ball, I mean water, I think it's what it's called, like a water ball fight. And then a spike ball and more. There's a lot going on at Spring Fling, so it's exciting. Okay, question for you though, but do you know how um, the individuals who went to state for track and then softball and baseball did? I know for track, Mason Davis got third in the hundred. And then I think our boys four by one got like 13th or 12th. And that's all I think I know so far. Thank you so much, Sophia. Okay, moving on to agenda item 4.02, public comment. Public comment forms received after the meeting has started will be saved for the following meeting. We welcome and value public comment on educational issues and recognize the importance of the opportunity for members of the public to express their thoughts to the school board. It is a policy of the Monroe School District to promote mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. We kindly ask that you refrain from comments that violate school district policy. 
Individuals are asked to limit comments to three minutes. A designated speaker for a group is asked to keep comments to five minutes. If you have a personnel concern, any staff member in the room can help with how to go forward with a complaint about personnel. The board does not respond to public comments during the business meeting. Please know that the board's silence is neutral. It is neither a signal of agreement nor disagreement with the speaker's remarks. The president may interrupt or terminate an individual's statement when it is personally directed, abusive, obscene, irrelevant, targets a protected class, or exceeds the time limit. As the board president, I will determine the appropriateness of all such rulings. When I call your name, please step up to the microphone. If attending the meeting virtually, please join as a panelist, allow video, and unmute your microphone. Do we have anyone online? Or... Okay, uh, Milena Shipley. No, okay. Okay, moving on to our in-person people. Uh, we have Joshua Cruz. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. As a brief introduction, my name is Joshua Cruz and I'm a senior at Mineral High School, as well as the current commanding officer of the Snohomish MC JRTC program. I'm here tonight to give a thank you to you all to the love and support you've not only shown myself, but to the uh, MC JRTC program as a whole. It is due to such love and care that I have the confidence to stand in front of you all tonight and say thank you for all that you've done. A little over a year ago, I stood before you much like tonight advocating for such program and expressing to you the beliefs of, set of the program to, and how it benefits our young youth in our community. I described how the program helps build confidence and character, gives leadership experience, and creates bonds and connections like no other. Tonight, I share some of mine with you. In class, we as students are placed in a safe environment to grow, learn, and even stumble as growing leaders surrounded by friends and family. Our instructors give us all the help and support we could need with the understanding that we approach everything with the attitude of trying everything and supporting everyone. The climate, and unlike anything I've ever experienced uh, anywhere else in high school, gives both reassurance and time to help students build a level of confidence you can't find anywhere else. It is due to this confidence that I, help, that I have had the opportunity to be a part of and meet our superintendent via the student uh, and stu the student superintendent interview process earlier this uh, earlier this earlier last year. <laughs> the MC Jersey program doesn't just give access to relationships inside our schools, but also our community. Through these opportunities, I've had the honor to work with and connect with organizations like the American Legion, local VFW, and more, uh, and even some of you present uh, as as members of the board. And it is also thanks to this amazing program and organization that I have had the uh, ability to give over almost 600 hours of community service over the past four years of my life. Uh, and it has helped me build an understanding and respect for those who sacrifice give me such an opportunity and, my, and, and those like me. Uh, like Ms. Cassie Myers from the VFW, Craig Robertson, the Monroe High School School Resource Officer, and my own instructors, Captain Lennon and Mass Sergeant Torres. When leadership comes to mind, I think of traits such as confidence, directness, understanding, and what I believe most important, approachability. There is a difference between a leader and a manager. While a manager's main focus is on the goal completion, a leader connects with those around them, and if done right, a leader will become someone you can turn to and rely on in times of need. It is such, it is such a program that builds leaders in our society and. Uh, and with the effort of building citizenship. Over the past four years between COVID, masking, and, experience, and the experience we call high school, the JRTC for me has been an unchanging solid rock and boon for me to find consistency, family, and peace. I have met many people uh, through the program that I will, that I can confidently say are lifelong friends. And in this class, I know we'll continue to give others the same. And it is for that reason that I ask you to maintain uh, your support for the program. Now, I apologize for such a long speech, uh, but I want to say once again, thank you all for the support you've shown myself in this program. 
as I know, it will not only continue to build leaders, but it will continue to show and give many others in our in our high school a place to they call home. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, and it, sorry, no, sorry, I know uh, last time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. Okay, I don't have a name on this one, but under comments says new policies do not go far enough. <laughs> okay, your name and your relationship to the school district. Yeah, my name is Dorothy Schroeder, and I taught sixth grade for 20 years. Now I'm a substitute in the district. And um, I just wanted to make sure and uh, applaud parents and district personnel for bringing the huge issue of phones and um, not having them in the school, uh, in schools from thoughts to words to finally to actions. It's been a problem for a long, long time in schools. Uh, I'm in favor of phones, not only being out of the classroom, but also out of the lunchroom. Um, these are positive first steps at reducing screen distractions in schools and enabling students to learn and social skills at getting along in groups and practice those social skills. Um, I believe that they're gonna vote on one or the other to make it a district policy. And the problem I have um, is that I, I don't feel that it goes far enough. Um, there's, I can't help but notice a lot of police in the back of the classroom. And I'm sure that they can attest that you can make a law or a policy. And that's one step and it's a very important one. But even more important is enforcing that law or that policy, or it has no effect. And unfortunately, it's the teachers and the district personnel which are gonna have to enforce that policy. And so um, I, I know it's not on the vote or the agenda, so the only thing I can do is encourage uh, future thought or actions by parents uh, to consider just not having kids bring their phones to school at all. And when they consider the possible uh, blowback or issues or bickering or problems that come up when they ask their uh, kids that, to think about the teachers who also face those problems all the time and that they would be helping teachers and the other students in the classroom and administration who are trying so hard to do their jobs to avoid all that if parents just didn't bring their, excuse me, encourage their students not to bring their cell phones to school at all. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Carrie? Hi, Carrie. Your name and your relationship to the school district. Yes, my name is Carrie Robertson. I am the mom of Joshua. <laughs> I stand here before you all tonight as a grateful parent. For 13 years, my son has received an excellent education, wonderful opportunities to grow and have the opportunity to be a productive young man in our society. I can stand here tonight and tell you mission accomplished. As he stated earlier, he was honored to sit on the school panel that interviewed our new superintendent. He did this very thoughtfully. He researched each of the candidates, looked them up on the internet, thought of very careful questions to ask, because he realized the impact that he was going to put forth was not just the future, of, was, was for the future of our school district, not just his. I thank you for the continued support of the MCJRTC program here at MHS, and now for the first time this year, Sky Valley. This is a leadership program that provides opportunities of leadership in a safe and healthy environment. It imports the importance of productive, being productive in our communities. They are taught skills of communication, service, not only to the community, but to each other. Long-term financial planning, how to use a map, believe it or not, GPS doesn't always work. Um, and mistakes are okay. It's how we deal with said mistakes that makes the difference in their lives. 
It teaches cadets respect, commitment, honor, and discipline. These students become family. They learn that they can rely on each other. They support each other every day. He worked with many of you along with Captain Lynn and Brendan Rotaria to increase our student population from 20 to 36. This was a huge win for the students of the high school in Sky Valley because now they can join and have those experiences also. As commanding officer this year for the first time in Monroe history for this program, he has amazed me. There are things that he has faced with it to help his fellow cadets that I don't know if most high schools have to, students have to deal with. It has taught him to be approachable, caring, and supportive. It has given him the confidence to realize the next journey in his life is just that. It's an extension of what he's already learned. Last year, he joined drill team. And for the first time this year, the majority of the drill team cadets were from Monroe High School. This was a five time a week practice at 6 a.m. in weekend competitions. Joshua would get up many times by four o'clock to make sure he'd go pick up everybody to be on time um, at the 6 a.m. call. This year, they excelled. They ended up third place for our region out of 36 schools for arm drill. This is an amazing feat. And I thank you for the school district for the recognition and praise of this team. It is well-deserved. I did wanna express my support for the continued contract for the SRO, Craig Robertson. This is a program that, in my opinion, that cannot put a, be put a price on. I'm glad we invest in the safety of our students, not only for their physical safety, but their, their emotional well-being. The SRU, excuse me, SRO is, works hard to get to know the students and demonstrate their willingness to help them be successful, to be safe, not only in the school, but in their community and their home. The SRO is an invaluable resource to school officials for trends and any other such things that are happening in our community within the area. I just want to say that I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the education and opportunities that my son has had available to him. He could not have done this without the support of JRTC, Captain Lennon, Master Sergeant Torres, Brenda Renteria, the thesis teachers, and most importantly, the board. And I say thank you. Thank you, Carrie. I did want to include a comment that um, we got from Elena Shipley. I don't know if I'm saying that because this was submitted on time, but there was a comment submitted too. It said, we should definitely keep Craig as our police officer at Monroe High School and for others for safety in case something bad happens. He does way too much for us and we should all thank him at some point. Thank you, Melena. Okay. I also did want to recognize, we did receive a number of emails uh, from our community and support uh, of our SRO. And so all board directors did receive a copy as well. Okay, moving on to agenda item 4.03, consideration of donations. All right, <clears throat> we have a number of donations to acknowledge and thank the community for. Uh, Edward Rosenthal has donated the following item to Monroe School District, a 1978 Hon Hondu Les Paul copy, electric guitar, and a case value of $500. Thank you. Edward Rosenthal also donated um, a 1985 Ovation round body guitar and case with a value of $800. Farland's PTA has donated to the Monroe School District a monetary grant of $2,857.17 for the sole and express purpose of purchasing an Ultima 65 machine along with a film service laminator. Thank you very much. Park Place Middle School PTO has donated um, $1,750 for the sole and express purpose of the Park Place Robotics Advisor to use as needed. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody, for the donations. Thank you, Director Edsborn. Okay, moving on to agenda item. Agenda item 5.02, School Resource Officer Services Agreement. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves 
the service. Oh, no, it, we don't need to do it because it's just a consideration. We don't need a motion. Oh, wait, sorry, I skipped 5.01. I was really eager there. Okay, agenda item 5.01, consideration of revisions to policy 3245, students and telecommunication devices. And this is our first reading. Um, and we'll hand it over to Superintendent Woodward. Well, I'm positive that Chief Jolly and the crew wanted to be here for this discussion. So you'll get to hear about cell phones in schools. So, uh, okay, so what we have tonight is a couple policy options based on feedback that we received from students, staff, and parents and guardians regarding the utilization of, we're calling them personal electronic devices because it's more than just cell phones uh, in our schools. At last week's board workshop, we shared feedback from the Thought Exchange Survey, which uh, over 900 people participated in, in that. So tonight we have policy options. We had someone that made public comment tonight talk about something that if you adopt a policy, then our administrative team, we've already started working on a potential administrative procedure that would go over our consequences and how we respond if the policy is being violated. Uh, that's true with much of the board policy um, uh, policies that you already have. A lot of the, the discipline consequences is in procedure. So we'll get to that as well. So both of the options tonight, they include exceptions to the rules. Uh, you shared that as a concern a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in, the event, in the event of an emergency situation that involves imminent physical danger, or a school administrator authorizes a student to use a device, or for students who have an IEP, 504 plan, or health plan, that includes specific accommodations for assistive technology. Uh, they, that would just follow the process that was outlined in the plan. Option one, uh, please note that the exception for use of phone in emergency situations was inadvertently left out. That was my fault. We can make sure that's in the next iteration. The difference between the two options, as you probably remember, you were having some good discussions around if we are not allowing personal electronic devices, what does that really mean? So the first option basically just says it's, it's, it's um, not okay to use them at all. If, 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 if you do bring one, they have to be powered down and out of sight. Um, that's pretty clear, I th think. Uh, this one also, I'll, I'll, well, I'll skip to the option two here for a second. Option two for grades K through eight basically just says that students could use them only before and after the regular school day. And then for grades nine through 12, that uh, the devices will be turned on and operated before and after the regular school day and during lunch. And then at all other times out of, out of, out of sight. There is another uh, issue that was brought up at our district leadership team meeting today, and and um, and I know our principals are concerned about this as well. That uh, we'd love for you to discuss use of cell phones on buses as well. Um, that's been a an, an issue that has caused some pretty distinct problems that carries on into the school day as well. And I don't believe. Uh, this these either of these policy really recognizes that or, or discusses on on the bus outside of if you are you utilizing them you have to follow school policy let's see here are you looking at option one the green the last green paragraph um while students are on school grounds at school sponsored events or on school buses yeah. yeah, that's basically just the way I look at that. It's, it's just that you, if you're utilizing them, you are still abiding by all of these rules. I don't know that it clearly states in either one that they're prohibited on school buses. That's a good thing for you, okay. you to discuss yeah. as well. So there you have it. Let the discussion begin, I guess. So, the, yeah, I just have a quick question. Last time we talked about, um, that sometimes um, teachers ask students to use their phones to turn an assignment. Do you have feedback from teachers how much this would impact their lesson plans? 
Well, the only feedback that we really have thus far is what you saw in the thought exchange. The, as Jeremiah referenced last time, a lot of times our students will choose to use their phones because they're more familiar and a little bit less cumbersome than the Chromebooks, but these policies were written in such a way, we, we, we are a one-to-one -one school district. Every student has a Chromebook that you can turn assignments in at school. So if you would like there to be an exception with cell phones for that purpose, that would be something that you could consider as well. Isn't it fun that we get to decide something like this? Uh, so I'm a member of the Monroe Community Coalition and the thing that's always been on my heart is the, uh, the mental health and the difficulties the students face during COVID, the isolation, uh, separated from kids, from other, from their friends, uh, the community coalition submitted a letter to the board and I wanted to just to go through some of these. Uh, the board is familiar with them, but I wanted to share these with the audience. Um, first off, 77% of school districts across the United States limit cell phone use. The heavy phone use, so kids having them in an unlimited manner, they have lower academic performance and GPA. Large body of research shows that classroom small, smartphones impacts learning, memory, commitment, recall, and grade point averages. Next one's poor student behavior. Cell phone use is also strongly associated with poor emotional self-regulation, impulsivity, shyness, and low self-esteem and contribute to classroom disruption and victimization. Mental health, mental health disorders comprise one of the largest health problems facing use and heavy cell phone use exac exacerbates this issue. Uh, researchers have linked student cell phone use to higher rates of depression, anxiety symptoms, psychological distress and suicidal uh, tendencies. Next one is bullying and cyberbullying. Researchers have, and, and by the way, this is all evidence-based and it has I'm sure it's available to anybody that wants to use it. Uh, all these are cited in terms of uh, evidence-based studies. I'm looking at all these uh, notes here, footnotes. Uh, research also found that youth who own cell phones are more likely to be victims of cyberbullying and that cyberbullying typically leads to face-to-face -face bullying. Let me go into that a little bit more. And then cheating and academic dishonesty. Cell phones raise concerns about cheating during exams and assessments. National survey conducted by the Betson Group uh, showed that more than one third of teens said they used their cell phones to cheat on exams or nearly two thirds reported seeing their peers do so. And then the sixth point, uh, increased educational equity. Scientists have found that cell phone restrictions positively impact standardized test score for all students, but significantly benefit low achieving students. So for, for me, speaking as an individual, I think we should go with uh, the option one, which is limiting cell phone use throughout the day. Um, it's going to lead to better socialization, relationships, everything that was damaged, curtailed, destroyed during the unforgivable COVID limitations that our government imposed on the school district. Uh, this is a means to get past that towards to heal and to have our kids socially, emotionally, physically, psychologically better. So James, kind of to your point, asking about when teachers ask them to pull out cell phones, my kids don't have cell phones. So if teachers ask them to pull out cell phones, my kids are going to be left out of the, of the exercise in class. Like 
the superintendent says every single one of them have Chromebooks. And if they need to do something, if something needs to be researched, they can always use those because otherwise we're gonna have kids who will be left out. That's kind of how I look at that. Um, also, I would say, I, you know, I'd want no cell phone use on buses included in here. I mean, that's kind of the beginning of the school day for a lot of these kids, right? They're on the buses, they're interacting with their peers. Uh, and I just feel like this should overflow into that. I'm 100% all for option one. My kids don't have cell phones for a reason right now. Um, and I, I just feel like to Chuck's points, they're gonna be able to interact with one another better. They are going to be able to form relationships, know what it's like to do that in person rather than on a screen. Uh, I see kids walking around continually everywhere on screens to the point where they're not even aware of their own safety or the safety risks that they're putting themselves in while they're crossing the street or walking down the sidewalk and just not paying attention to their surroundings. So I think the less time on them, the better. Um, also, another point that I had thought of you know, bringing them out in classrooms, if teachers are gonna do that, what's to say then that these kids aren't going to start interacting and doing other things unless the teacher's coming around and trying to monitor every single personal device while they're doing whatever exercise it is in class. So I kinda, I feel like for those two reasons that it, it really should be no cell phones during the school day at all period included on buses. You know, unless you have a specific IEP 504 or IHP that specifically spells out the these are the reasons that this student needs to use the cell phone. So those are my two cents. And then also, since Director Campbell cannot be here today, he has some thoughts on this as well, and he asked them to be shared. So. Uh, pertaining to this, with the overwhelming responses from our community survey, the research that has been presented to us about personal devices and their distractions to education and neg negative effects on students, and with the responses from staff, I would vote for option one. No use of these devices at all during the school day with the exceptions to student accommodations for documented IEP, IHP, and 504 plans that state these devices are necessary. I know this will be a difficult shift for students this fall, but if we all work together for their help and benefit, their success is more important. And I completely agree with that. It will be a hard transition, but their success and their mental health and their well-being is far more important than a small inconvenience of not being able to use your cell phone during the day at school. So if we do this, uh, you know, ban the... PEDs on buses. How can we possibly enforce that? I mean, we have one bus driver, 30, I don't know, however many, 15, 20 kids on there. I just like, I'm, we had a magic wand. Yes, that'd be nice, but I mean, how is that possible? Yeah, I think that's something just as well as um, how to manage it during the course of the school day. We would need to come back with clear administrative procedure. I'd have to meet with Mike and meet with a handful of bus drivers to have that conversation. And there are other things that we prohibit on the buses and they're, they're responsible for, for managing behavior already. It would be one more thing and something that's a, a little more ingrained in more kids than some of the typical behaviors that we see that are not allowed on the bus. Uh, but yeah, very, very challenging uh, for sure. And there are, I've, I don't know of so many implications this school year that could have been avoided. Um, some of it is just the exposure kids have. If you're sitting next to somebody on a bus with the cell phone, they can access whatever they want, depending on their, 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 the way their parents are managing that, that device, um, all the way to videotaping students. And, uh, and when, when those kids don't know about it and pushing that around on social media. So the implications are, large and the consequences while at the same time i appreciate what you're saying i my initial reaction personally was yeah how in the world could we do that that's gonna be tough but it, we just have to start by having the discussions with the right people and coming up with a plan um yeah i agree with option number one too I, to be honest i i even i look at option one and i think it might end up looking like option two because you know, we're so tight at the beginning, but with the expectation that um, there are opportunities there. Um, and the that was my question was the bus question. I think as long as we clearly communicate 
with uh, families and students when they're able to. I have athletes, for example, and I know that they are everywhere. I have to be able to communicate with them. I think of kids who are in band or maybe there's a schedule change or mom can't be there or whatever it is um, to pick up. So just clearly, clearly identifying like after school, there's, you know, a 10 minute wait or whatever for the bus. And that's where they can turn on and communicate. And then before they load up on the bus, phones are off again. Um, so I, I always think like, as long as there is clear instruction, um, it's helpful because then at least you know what to expect. Um, and I try to do that with my own children, but I'm thinking with families, what that, what that may look like. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And then Another consideration that maybe this is for another time. I've been in districts that we've chosen to have hotspots on buses for uh, athletics and activities for kids to do their homework. We have some students that have very long bus rides still that that's when they're getting that done. And, and so maybe that's a conversation, you know, when we start talking about, do we want hotspots on buses for certain reasons? And because they're, they're there are obviously times when technology is a huge support as well. Um, I did, I will also say, and I, forgive me, Jen, if you're good at, going to get to this, I'm sure you were, but I did mention to Sophia and Laura that's very, very rare that um, we have policies that they're remotely interested in. So mm -hmm. um, don't, not to put you on the spot, Sophia, but I know we'd love to hear some of your thoughts too. I already put you on the spot. It's too late. Sorry about that. Um, I'll say what I think, being fully honest. So I think especially like, I think it's good that phones would be banned from class because I my Spanish class is my only class that doesn't have our phones out during class. And I actually like it. And we all pay attention way more. And we all are way more social. I know it's like a Spanish class, so we're supposed to be talking a lot, but we are way more social compared to like my history class, which it's first period and nobody wants to talk to each other. And like literally everybody's on their phone. And my history teachers, she's tried so hard and like, she's pretty naive. So the kids kind of just don't care what she says. But I think for lunch or flex, it would be not that great. Cause like, there's been a lot of times in high school where I didn't even have any classes with my friends. So the only way I'd like talk to them during school is by texting them and be like, where are you going for lunch? Or what class are you choosing for flex? So that would be kind of annoying. And then or like, if you need to text your mom, like, hey, I forgot my lunch, can you bring it right now? And then, um, I don't know, especially for the juniors and seniors, I already know they were pretty upset about post campus and saying they felt like children, especially when they were about to go off to college and the good amount of them being 18. Um, and I don't know, we spend seven hours a day at school. So it's kind of hard to like, what if you need to make plans? Like if my aunt texts me like, hey, I need to know by 120 if you can come with me later or not, but I can't text her all day. So now by the time I get out of school, it's too late. Um, and then I took the bus for a long time and it was 40 minutes long. And I usually, I would talk to the kids on the bus, but sometimes they weren't always the nicest or like the best kids. So like listening to music was nicer than talking to kids, especially the ones that, get really crazy on the bus. They're not like the best influences sometimes and I'd rather just listen to music, but that's just my honest opinion. And, and I will say, I, I know that Laura and Sophia couldn't make it to our workshop. And that seems to be kind of the sentiment. It's interesting how the adults, you know, in the survey feel very different than our, our students do, of course. And you, you saw that in the thought exchange. So it's just one of those issues. It's tough in that way. Um, can you talk a little bit about this uh, bullet E? If, you know, if we go for the full cell phone ban, I mean, um, it's uh, it's on both of them. Whatever it's labeled as E, it talks about basically by bringing a, a PED to school, you give consent to um, school administrator to search it if they have any belief that it violated or that student violated any of the rules. Now this says like anytime it's in school grounds is like some students up in the stands at a basketball game or something like if we're going with a full ban is this a little over the top to also do e um this is, is also 
it's part of current policy. So this is just a revision yeah. to our current policy on just telecommunication devices. So um, by having that, it just gives us, it's, it's clearly spelled out on policy that if, if there's something very serious going on um, that was illegal or, you know, we can confiscate that phone, it, uh, not having it, it's better that a lawyer, our district lawyer would say it's better to have that in there. Um, you might say, well, if it's not in there, couldn't we do that anyways? It's like, um, yes, and it's good to probably outline that for uh, for people as well, because it's not unusual that we'll, we have to do that. Uh, to search the phone, you're saying? Uh, to, to confiscate a phone. And, yeah, confiscate is covered elsewhere. Though. This is just about searching it. Yeah, this is basically... D is confiscate. I think this this is in there to, to give you the, the ability to do so if, if, if you needed to, and it was spelled out clearly. So if the board did not think that we should be doing that for some reason, then we would take it out. If the board thinks there may be times when we would have to do that, then I would suggest you leave it in. Because, because you're, you're removing our ability to do so if, if it's not in there. Yeah. Well, there's just no phones at school already. Ideally, in the first place. Yeah. So as you 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 will you know in talking with the other district, having a policy will not prevent kids from bringing phones to school. <laughs> so course, so so, so, in the event that they bring them, and we're not we're not saying you can't have them at a basketball game. Um, there will be students, of course, that are going to bring their phones and have them out at lunch doing things that they shouldn't be doing. That's happening at in River Middle School right now, and they have a policy. This just allows, again, not to be redundant, that administrator to work with law enforcement or with our legal counsel to do what we need to do um, if, if there's something very serious that we need to check into. Okay, and yeah, I'm in support of option one as well. You know, Sophia, I really appreciate your comments. I'm. Uh... I'm from a different generation, if you believe it or not. And we, we had uh, through high school and through college, in fact, it was only so like 2006 that uh, the cell phones came out. Uh, and it is as much of a challenge for students as it is for parents. My wife, namely, uh, she's not watching tonight, so I could say that. Um, it's recorded of, though, Chuck. It is recorded. I'm not very clever <laughs> in my age. Uh, Sorry. It's uh, overall, I, you know, in, in our board workshop, I, I went back to the basic part of it is we're here to educate kids and it's about education and the, uh, the consequences of using cell phones is so, so horrendous. Joe could come up and talk, Joe Nigel uh, could come up and talk about uh, the uh, harassment, intimidation, and bullying that occurs with cell phones and can just be mean. And, you, you know, you, I've talked to a lot of people my age and maybe within 10 or 15 years, and we used to get, uh, there was always bullying, you know, there's bullying going on. But I tell you what, these cell phones, they could be stinking mean. They could be horrendous and it's it's really unfair to to kids uh so anyway i just wanted to share those thoughts um it's really i'm just really concerned about the mental health and um and also with adults all of us i mean i'm i'm on my phone but it's always checking email for business i got seven emails now i just got on another board so i got issued a, a seventh email and uh life's busy Life's getting quicker. Business is getting it's getting fast. Anyway, option one. Yeah, I was trying to, you said 2006. I was trying to think of what I was doing up at Monroe High School. And I graduated in 03. And I remember having to go down to the front office whenever I needed to call my mom or do anything and get a note and go back. Um, but that was how I would access my mom. 
if I needed anything. And it's just so different. I think we also had a closed campus then. Um, yeah, it's just different. I thank you though, Sophia. That's really good information. Yeah, I respect you guys' opinion, especially growing up in a different time. I mean, you guys managed, so I know we can, but it will definitely be a big change. So we've got, so thank you very much for the feedback. So we'll go back and uh, between Holly and I, we'll make some adjustments and bring another one back for a second uh, reading. Next I, time. I would also love to see what the procedure would look like. So say if it says, if a student brings a PED to school, it shall be powered off and out of sight. What if it is not powered off and out of sight? What does that look like? Um, and just making it consistent between all of the schools that we have. And the same for the bus. I can't imagine having to drive a bus, navigate that, and then have all of the things going on in the back of the bus with students um, and trying to make sure that they are being respectful um, of each other and uh, the bus, the school property. So just looking to see what that process and procedure would look like. You bet. And, and I will definitely need a, a little a bit of time on that. And so we'll, um, knowing that I, you know, I wasn't totally sure that you would go in this direction. I had a pretty good guess, uh, but we had our first conversation and our administrative team knows, Hey, it's on us to develop that. Uh, we've, we had a good, we have a good starting point. We'll continue to find time to work on that with the goal being, you know, maybe somewhere along the line of if you do adopt, adopt this, which it sounds like you are in two weeks, we can communicate, maybe stage the communication out. Uh, I, I think, it, I, I think it could definitely take us probably a good, uh, through the end of June to come up with a solid administrative procedure, which will give us plenty of time to communicate that to students and families prior to them starting the school year. Uh, that I think, I think that's even a little more nuanced and, and trickier than the policy itself. And hence the reason why you wanna see that, but you see a little bit of time. I, I do have one more question though. So when it comes to Sky Valley, Sky Valley is a little bit of a different scenario. Uh, what what do you envision that potentially looking like? Is that something that we would give a little more leeway to Karen and her team to try to figure out since it is a parent partnership and classes are spread out so far apart and it's just so incredibly different and there are a lot of parents on campus as well. What do you what are your thoughts on that? I mean, my my initial thoughts um, would just be. Uh, they're like everyone else. If, if any school can, they, they have to be, it would have to be able to manage as well. Um, uh, Karen was, was uh, participated in the, the last conversation and sh uh, shared her voice, much like the other principals that, that, that there were issues associated with this, but um, I definitely will meet with her one-on-one -on -one and maybe there's some things that I don't know about that you know about as a, as a parent of kids there where they, maybe it's different. Uh, is that what you're kind of feeling that maybe there would be some exceptions there? Just because it's it's different in being a parent partnership with parents on campus and, and there's so much going on there and sometimes classes are spaced hours apart. Um, it is easy enough for a kid to walk off campus and use their cell phone. So I, I don't anticipate that, but it was just sort of one of those things in the back of my mind. I'm sitting here thinking Sky Valley is different. How do we address that? Are we are we really keeping in, you're going to abide by this policy as well? Are we going to make an exception because they are an alternative learning education experience? You know, what, with a parent partnership, what, what were kind of the thoughts behind that? That was just sort of mm -hmm. one of it's those things. It kind of really goes just back to at least the conversations we've had thus far. Everyone has personal technology in the Chromebook. So uh, again, I'll follow up with Karen to discuss what, what might the exceptions be? It seems like there wouldn't really be any to me, but we have two parents right here that have kids at Sky Valley, you know more than I do. But I will follow up. Yeah, thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item 5.02, school resource officer services agreement. Is there a motion? 
Okay, I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve the 2024-2025 School Resource Officer Agreement. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the 24-25 School Resource Officer Agreement and discussion. Since Jeremiah is not here, you want me to start this off with his comments. <laughs> okay, so Jeremiah says the Monroe School District and City of Monroe, Monroe Police Department relationship has been wonderful and Officer Craig as our SRO has been incredible. He works hard to foster a positive relationship with students in our community. I'm in favor of voting to continue the SRO contract with MPD. I hope the rest of the board feels the same way. I definitely echo many of his sentiments. I think Officer Craig is exceptional just in knowing him as a human being uh, and also as our SRO, the lengths that he will go to to build relationships with students to help them feel safe and to give more than 100% in the job that he does. Um, we are so very lucky to have him. So Craig, thank you for everything that you do. You are truly appreciated uh, and you are an incredible and valuable resource to this school district. Yeah, I just wanna echo, uh, we got overwhelming support from the community. So thank you very much for all that you do. And we're really excited to have you part of our school. Uh, <clears throat> as the longer that you're on, on the board and you're familiar with the school system <laughs> and listening to risk management and safety for our students, for our staff, uh, emergency preparedness, um, the police department and the school are so closely linked in the event something were to happen and that also goes out to you know the, the sheriff and other state agencies. To have an individual at the school is uh, invaluable, and I'm always have always supported it and always will. So it's important and necessary. Hey guys, thank you for all that you do. I know so many of you. I see you all around town. So thank you for infusing yourselves and being a part of this community. Um, I do want to recognize, I, I loved, uh, I read through the agreement, but part of what I do love, I went and read up on the RCW. Um, but then you guys go above and beyond uh, MPD. And that's really exciting. Uh, there's also, there's training in addition to all the work that you already do. And that's um, child and adolescent development, trauma-informed approaches to working with youth, recognizing and responding to youth mental health issues, uh, bias-free po policing and cultural competency, na local and national disparities in the use of force and arrest of children. And it goes on and on. So I just wanna recognize uh, how incredible we, we are how lucky we are to have such an incredible group um, in Monroe and serving our students. So thank you so much for continuing to partner with us and again, for being part of this community. Um, and any other questions, comments? Okay, there is a motion. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, the agenda item has passed four to zero. Would we be able to get a quick picture? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you look picture ready, Craig.
Okay, agenda item 6.14, approval of the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the consent agenda dated May 28th, 2024. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the consent agenda dated May 28th, 2024. All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed four to zero. Agenda item 7.01, Superintendent Woodward, it is your update. All right, so just wanted to talk briefly about some of the district level committees that we have going to wrap up the school year and they will continue to go on into the coming months. They're all new committees and all the committees are, are just the intent is to help us inform our actions moving forward in some really important areas. So. Uh, I'll start with, we have a science of reading committee going right now, and uh, myself and Jennifer Murphy, who's here, are co-facilitating that, and then we have two elementary teachers from each of our schools, and we also have one of our elementary principals uh, serving on the con committee as well. So basically what we're doing is we're conducting a real thorough crosswalk analysis to identify components of, of, of the science of reading, which are phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension with our current curriculum to make sure there are no gaps. Um, there was a uh, podcast, is it sold a lie, Jen? Sold a story uh, years ago that got people actually talking about the science of reading. And there was lots of concern, you know, does, do our instructional materials align with that science? So we have a team that is working through that right now. And we are determining whether or not we have to make adjustments and potentially buy some new materials uh, to make sure they're, we're doing what is uh, what we know works for literacy instruction. We also have, I mentioned the Monroe High School Schedule Advisory Committee that we have going on right now. And Chris McDuffie, as you remember, Chris works for the highest search firm that did the uh, superintendent searches. She's facilitating that. She's a um, former superintendent and just a total rock star high school principal in her, her day as well. She's facilitating. We have eight to 10 staff members on that committee, some parents, and we're working on getting some students there as well. Uh, just a reminder, the committee will be, will be making schedule recommendations for the 25-26 school year. And uh, their first two meetings will be June 5th and June 18th. And they're gonna have a recommendation really to, to us uh, by uh, November 1st because of the staffing implications for the following school year. We also have the, uh, we're doing some work with leaders in learning and trying to figure out does, is that school best meeting the needs of our students uh, right now? Uh, Kim, they're, and they're doing a great job, I would say, they're phenomenal school, great staff, all of that, but we want to take an opportunity to, to see if we need to make any adjustments moving forward. Uh, Kim Whitworth, I really appreciate uh, her facilitation of that group. Most of the leaders in learning staff are on the on the team, members of Monroe High School staff, including some counselors. Uh, Brett Willie's on that, and we're trying to build some cohesion there and get everybody in a room and talk about how to best serve our, our kids. And then we have district level administrators as well. So we're simply reviewing options for next year? What are all the different ways that we can serve uh, students who might need something a little bit different at, at, at the high school level? I would also add that uh, Karen from Sky Valley, she's on the team as well, because she's got a wealth of experience and expertise uh, in that area. The advisory team will make recommendations sometime in June. So they're, 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 they had a meeting tonight, um, which would be meeting number four, and they likely will meet one more time. And, and, and I will share with you any adjustments that we're gonna make uh, based on their recommendations. And finally, and again, this isn't everything we have going on committee-wise, it's just new teams that we have uh, right now. We also have a professional development action team. As you know, that's part of our um, strategic plan. Uh, Jen Murphy and, and Shannon uh, Tarek, who are both sitting next to each other back there, um, they're leading that. And uh, so far, David Peritor, Joe Nigel, uh, Jesse uh, Crowther, and are on the committee and we're looking for some principal reps. They are going to be reviewing all of the feedback that we have received uh, uh, from our staff, classified and certificated, as far as what they perceive 
their needs are moving forward. We had 166 people participate. It might not sound like a lot, but we ask, we do a lot of surveys, and uh, I know sometimes people get a little burned out with that, but 166 relative to others is, is a lot of feedback from our, our staff. Uh, we are really preparing for our August training right now. That's the purpose of this particular team. We have staff training on August 26th, 27th, 28th, and 29th. Uh, so not a lot of days to work with our staff and we wanna make sure it's in alignment with what they're saying they, they really need support with. What we're hearing so far probably won't be a surprise because we heard this from teacher focus groups on the front end of the strategic plan. Uh, people want support with be student behavior management. That's one of the top areas. Uh, how do we best engage our students so there's good behavior? And how do we respond and support kids differently uh, when, it, when it does occur so there's less repeat behavior? So there's definitely gonna be something with that. And then a lot of interest in how do we intervene appropriately when students are struggling when it comes to their learning? Uh, how do we help get them up to a uh, grade level standard? Um, and and all, all kinds of different learners were, were mentioned uh, in that survey. So definitely about intervention uh, for, for student learning and student behaviors. And one, one of my favorite sayings that stuck with me for the last 25 years is the best intervention is to get it right the first time. So we'll be talking a lot about, well, what do we do when we first introduce a concept to students. What's the very best instructional practice? How do we best engage students? So um, we've all been, you remember when you were a kid in high school, right? Uh, where did you behave the, 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 the best in classes that you cared about and that you were deeply engaged and you were passionate about the topic and it, it, there was all kinds of different modalities that um, it wasn't just listening to someone you could learn by doing, right? So we're going to examine tier one practice as well as intervening if tier one's not working. So I appreciate Jen and Shannon's uh, leadership in, in, in that area. So that's just some of what we have going. You, I, was just, I was worried that you might think we're just wrapping up the school year, but there's a lot more than that, of course. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. Okay, agenda item 8.01, board reports and or comments. Any? Chuck Whitfield, or Director Whitfield. Well, do you guys know about the Open Public Meeting Act? So new, so two directors cannot speak to a third director. It's illegal. And we were fine with, uh, with the audit and that. Anyway. These two announcements are just to my board. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. So basically I was gonna tell you that I'm expecting, we are expecting a grandchild on Thursday. So that has the entire family focused on that. And I was just elected to a new board and am in charge of that. And uh, so that has a lot to do with what uh, where I'm at in life and uh, but uh, I thought I would just let my fellow board members know otherwise we'd have to have a secret phone conversation and a conversation tree anyway a little bit of information well thanks for that Chuck thanks for those updates and congratulations early on the new grandbaby that's very exciting so uh, just a couple things. Yesterday, I was able to go to two memorial events that we have, the first being at Lake Tai, something that the city puts on. Um, we place a wreath in honor of those from Monroe who have given their lives in service of this country. And then also uh, the memorial event up at the IOOF Cemetery that the VFW puts on. This year, it was incredible and a bit different from previous years. Not only did we have our amazing MCJROTC students that came and did color guard and also uh, did volleys in the back, three volleys. We also had our MHS choir acapella students. So there were six of them who came and sang the Star Spangled Banner for us uh, during that ceremony. And that was incredible. They all did an amazing job. And it just filled me with such joy to see 
Monroe High School students take an interest in what is going on in their community and to take time out of their day on a Monday to come and honor all of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that we have in this country. So uh, just a big encouragement to you to continue to be active and participate in your community and be present uh, and be the change that it is you want to see. But also just again, thank you for being there and giving your time. The other thing I got the pleasure of doing on Saturday, first my middle son and I, we went and we placed the flags on the graves of the veterans, remembering them as we went by and said their names and getting to see uh, veterans from the Spanish American War and the Civil War as well, which is also a really good history lesson in and of itself. Um, but just to be present with other people from our community to go up there early and remember all of our veterans that are there in that cemetery. But I also got to go to the powwow. So it was the 20th annual powwow that the Sky Valley Indian Education Program has put on. And it is, it is just an incredible event. When you are there, I always feel like I'm transported back in time to what what was and in the process I sort of mourn what could have been uh, but also just realizing that I'm I'm watching something that in its own right is kind of sacred and incredible and I love experiencing the culture I love how every single time the drum is beat it resonates through my body it's not just something that you kind of feel but man, it hits you right through the heart and your whole body feels it and vibrates with it. It's just a beautiful, beautiful display of culture. And it, it's always an honor to partake in that and to remember um, and learn at the same time. So uh, just a big thank you to the uh, SV uh, IE for all that they do to continue to put that on for all of the people who show up to help put that on uh, and those in the community who come out to support that. I think it's an, it's incredible that we have it here and that we have, you know, the cooperation of Snohomish and also the Salton school districts within that program. So yeah, that's what I did. And I hope everybody else enjoyed their longer weekend and had some time to, uh, just reflect and spend time with family. All right, I had the pleasure uh, two weeks ago to go to Monroe High School and go to the, the Misinformation Day. Uh, it's a curriculum put on or put together by the University of Washington. So half of the freshman class, I believe it through the Bearcat Academy, um, was went to this uh, big assembly for three hours where they got to learn about how to identify you know, misinformation online, how to identify, you know, a misleading post versus one, you know, that's out, outright lying. And I thought uh, the program was really well done. Um, it had some interactive games for the students to play and uh, help uh, deliver the message home. And I hope we can continue participating in future years. I think it's very valuable information in the, today's world. Thanks. Um, I also went to the powwow last Saturday. That was amazing. My nephew was there and he was in his outfit. It was just so cool. He's part native. Um, and so I saw my sister up there and her, um, her fiance and actually, so it'd be her father-in-law was the MC. So I was able to have a conversation, kind of meet everyone. Uh, powwows are amazing. They started in 04. It was a year, the year after I graduated. So um, so glad that I get to be a part of those now and I get to attend them. Um, and just friendly reminder of the, all the great things that are happening in our community. We have the farmer's market tomorrow at Galaxy, 3 to 7 p.m. I was able to talk to Janelle and she had all these wonderful things to say about it. And actually MPD will be there along with the SWAT team to open that event up. And then we also have in the community, let's see, I think the city is also partnering to open up Pride and Juneteenth, and they have a, more information on the Monroe City website, I believe. And so that will be Saturday, June 9th. Um, but yeah, if you're not getting those emails, those are really great to receive. And Jess is a, I'm going to be completing my fourth year on the board this summer. 
And I just have to say, it's such, um, it's so encouraging to see the community come together. We have families, we have people who really are continuing to support the work that's, um, that we've been doing here in Monroe. And I wanna thank the board as well for committing to that. We've been through some fires together and we came out, I think a little bit stronger, a little crispy, but that's okay, well seasoned, a little taller. I know I'm always like James you can't stand next to me I'm the smallest person here uh, but I just want to thank everyone I want to thank our teachers you guys are uh, working hard and I know that we're approaching the end of the year the school year and just hang in there we appreciate you so much all of our school admin our district office facilities thank you guys and um just I, I'm so appreciative because again we we did come out a little crispy at the end of that there were lots of learning opportunities but I'm so happy to be here I'm so happy to continue to serve the Monroe community and that we just have such great partners in our in our little community here so thank you it is 6 14 p.m and tonight's meeting is adjourned <laughs>